Hey folks, it's John from AS for Alcoholic again. Today's conversation is with Emily Davis. She is a musician from El Paso, Texas. And we talked, we talked about music. We talked about um, drinking, sobriety, recovery, um, and seltzer water, uh, among many other things. And one of the things that strikes me is how quick we are sometimes to dismiss our own story of recovery and sobriety from alcoholism. And in the midst of that, we're often not aware of how powerful and poignant and relatable it is. And so I really just want to thank her for coming on and sharing her story. It was really great to, to talk with her and to hear about everything she's been through. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Emily Davis. I'm not, I'm not like caught up yet completely. I'm at the beginning of 2020, so well, I have a feeling there's something big coming in March, but we'll see. It's, it's, <laughs> it's funny. Um, Cause yeah, there's all this backlog and you know, the podcast has always been sort of our own personal sort of what's going on in daily struggles. And it's so strange. I'll occasionally go back and listen to one and I'm like, Oh wow, that's right. That's what was happening. That's yeah. what's going on. So it's, it's very much um, this weird time capsule. You yeah. Know? Um, I'm sure you probably feel the same about your songs as well in some ways when you look back on them, yeah. you know? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, there's a song that always feels relevant. And then there's sometimes there's a song and you're like, well, I'm not that person anymore. So I don't know if I want to sing that anymore. <laughs> so and do you have, do you have those songs where you're like, yeah, that's just not me. And that's not something I'm interested in or don't feel. Yeah. Not so much with regard to like drinking, but I'm mm -hmm. maybe stylistically or um, right. the position I was coming from. Maybe I just don't relate to it as much. And it's not just for me playing a song is at any point when I'm playing it, it still has to be cathartic. Otherwise it feels kind of canned and I don't think I, it sounds as convincing. And so if I don't relate to a song when I'm performing and it's not enjoyable and honestly enjoyment of this whole music or art thing has to be number one for me or else it kind of feels like a venture in vanity so yeah there's definitely i can and i'm not uh, i don't i don't play any instruments and i i don't i don't sing but i love music and i i feel like i can always tell when somebody's not being genuine in their voice yeah when it feels forced or pushed or um the there's different uh, styles. And so it's like, uh, I feel like they're, they're doing that on purpose to sound a certain way. And then it kind of turns me off. Whereas when I hear somebody who's their genuine, um, authentic voice, you're like, wow, that's, that's them. They feel that. Right. Yeah. And that's part of what the whole sharing of it, you know, that's how I think that we get connected through music. And, you know, it's always been one of my favorite, um, uh, art forms because I don't think there's another art form out there that you can capture so much emotion or I can feel so much emotion in like two minutes and 50 seconds. You know what I mean? It's kind of like acting. I think a good, a good convincing vocal performance. I think you have to really emb embody, not all the time, maybe, I don't know. If you're like the cocktail twins and you're just making mumble sounds with your mouth, that might be different. But, um, you know, I think a lot of the time, Mm -hmm. you have, it, you're 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 telling a story or you're trying to convince somebody of something or relate something to them and you can't just today today i'm very happy it's like okay yeah i really i really believe you dude <laughs> you know you gotta, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, um so i wanted to i'm thank you for coming on here uh i've been listening to your music since um since we've been talking over the last couple of weeks and um, I wanted to talk to you because you're a sober artist and this kind of thing, these, these types of people, this, it's very interesting to me because, um, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about creating art sober versus not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's funny if, if anyone who knows me is listening to this, they're, they're, they're going to be like, 
they're a sober artist. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, I've, I've, I've it, you know, prior to quarantine, I was very much, I mean, I've only been sober for nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, it was nine months yesterday, actually. So congratulations. Um, thank you. I never really talked about it openly much yet because I'm, I'm still kind of like, I, I mean, I, I feel fairly confident that this is the road I'm going down and I want to stay down on it, but I also kind of figured maybe I'd wait a year. Um, but this is, this is cool. So I wanted to do this, but, um, I, that's why I, I would say if anyone who really knows me hears that, they'd be like sober artists. Like <laughs> I, I partied with her in Philadelphia. She wasn't just drinking. She was doing all <laughs> kinds of shit. Like, so, um, that's the experience of maybe many people on the road that we've interacted with. So to right. hear be, myself be referred to as a sober artist is just like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so so let me maybe I could rephrase that an artist who is currently um, experiencing um, experimenting or uh, you know creating sobriety in their yeah. life. Um, I think sober artist is still applicable because I've I've wanted to be sober for a long time I just wasn't and so to it's a nice it's nice to hear. I should probably rephrase. <laughs> okay, um, where do you? going back in your life and my favorite question to ask people is trying to track back to where they first remember alcohol either in their life from parents or from friends or themselves like what is your earliest memory of of alcohol in your life uh my parents are both byproducts of men who were hardcore alcoholics um they're not they're, they're very well adjusted normal lovely people but uh both of my my grandfathers um by blood relation or uh alcohol was such an incredibly destructive force in their life and so from a very young age my um impression of alcohol or alcoholism i think was just this extreme view of it it wasn't like some layman's disease it was like you know, the person who is just, I mean, destruction, I think is subjective, but my, 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 my first impression of alcohol or alcoholism was through the lens of two men who would just like destroyed their lives, destroyed their marriages, destroyed their bodies. One of them was, you know, he died from cirrhosis of the liver, but he'd been sober at that point for like 15 years, but he was, he would, it had still done so much damage to him. So I guess that was, it's funny to go from that to being somebody who abuses alcohol, hearing that, you know, have, coming from two adjusted families or people um, whose fathers weren't, but, you know, as a young person, having that impression on me or knowing that and that being my first exposure, you know, my thought go, growing up was I will never smoke a cigarette because multiple grandparents died from it. I will never be an alcoholic because my parents, their childhoods and young adulthoods were made so much more difficult because of the abuse of alcohol by their fathers. Um, and I went from that to struggling with alcohol. So it's kind of weird, but that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, I think we, we grow up and, you know, certainly being, being a teenager, it was, I remember having thoughts of like, I don't, I would never drink or do drugs. That's not, that's not who I am. And then hearing about friends who were smoking pot and like, what? I can't believe you were smoking pot. And, you know, at this point, I'm like 14 or 15 or something, oh, yeah. you know, completely like just appalled by the whole thing. And then years later, <clears throat> um, do you remember like the first time that you actively started drinking or the first experience? I was in high school. Um, I was always kind of a nerd or looked on as somebody who wouldn't be able to hang very straight and narrow kid I was raised in the church and so um I think my friend group who wasn't really you know they were they were typical high schoolers they were partying and experimenting and living and I was in the corner playing my guitar and praying or <laughs> whatever I was doing <laughs> um I think they had this perception of me that I couldn't hang and um the first time I ever drank uh we went to a friend's apartment I was one of my friends was dating a guy who was, I think I was like 17, 16, and she was dating a dude who was like 20, 21. So we went to his apartment. He had like some closet absinthe. Um, and then 
a bunch of them, but like a bunch of the older kids bought us younger kids booze. And so I remember them asking what I wanted and I had no idea. And so I was just like, I don't know, I've heard of Mickey's. So just get me like one thing of Mickey's. I'll have one Mickey, please. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think I was raised with enough common sense to know I am not touching closet absinthe. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah and i remember you know seeing other people at this party get obliterated when one of my friends got like a concussion because she had a little bit too much closet absinthe and i ended up like making mac and cheese for everybody and just going i did it like i drank the whole mickey's and i got buzzed but i can handle alcohol i'm mm-hmm. i'm a rare breed i'm different i proved them wrong and everyone i think everyone like expected me to go to the party and just like face plant after an hour and i was the one who kind of held up the best I think and so I think that was my first experience with alcohol and going oh, I'm, I'm good at this like I mm-hmm. and I think that like positive affirmation from people who were like oh wow you can hang you're not you're not gonna vomit after 10 seconds you know I think that was like something that I liked was that reinforcement did you find it to be was it so it, it was something that it wasn't like this magic elixir instantly changed everything it was just <sighs> a it was fun ex- yeah i think um, i was um i think it was i think being able to like hang out with people and have like i'm, I'm just always been very socially awkward um so i don't know if it was a magical elixir and it was like oh, i want more this is great like i'm i'm a different person it was just like i'm doing something that i never thought i'd do and i'm i'm not like doing it horribly and i'm, I'm getting good feedback while I do it. And I've, I've always been such a nerd and haven't had so many great experiences with socializing growing up that that's what I think opened the door for me more than anything. Right, the confidence and the inclusion and yeah. the acceptance. Right. Yeah. I mean, we all, I think that's, 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 that's a pretty common thing. I know that was something that I felt too, like, Oh, wow, people like me and it's because I can drink. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then you start drinking in high school does it take long before there are, are there any problems with it or is it is it just fun on the weekends yeah I mean I don't think any problems really started until I was a young adult I mm-hmm. think it was something that I just I think I drank maybe like a like a quote normal high schooler drink uh, or young adult drink until I was maybe 20, 21. Mm-hmm. And then it, I think it became, I think my brain still told me this is how normal 21, 20 year olds drink because, you know, I'd go to parties and every now and then there'd be someone who was in the bathroom with the spins. And I, when I would go to the bathroom with the spins, it was like, oh, this is normal. People do this. This is, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I, yeah, you get that skewed perception when you're spending, you know, not a lot, but most of your time drinking is at these parties and it's in excess Mm -hmm. right and that's just normal now i mean how many times had i blacked out or gotten sick and just that was just part of the that was part of the deal right right? that was just that just proved to people how i don't know tough i was (laughs) that i could hang that i could go through all that suffering and then get you know rub some dirt on it and get back in the game kind of thing um did you find so in your early 20s and now now you can actually drink in public too and i i found that this was a time where things got a little more elevated and heightened for me Mm -hmm. um going to bars and clubs and stuff like that did that change your um the way that you drank it's interesting i got married when i was very young and I got married to someone who I think would have been that he at the time was abusing alcohol. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I think a, a lot of the earliest, you know, I got married when I was 19. So 19, 20, 21, part, partly into 22. I feel like a lot of my time drinking was every now and then I'd get, I'd get messed up and he'd have to deal with me. But I feel like a lot of the time I'd have to deal with him more, more often than not. And so um, really, I don't think, I noticed in myself, like something like, oh, this might be an issue until after we got divorced. But Mm -hmm. there was a couple of times when we were, you know, together where I would, you know, have to like open a car door and puke or 
um, get, get the spins at a party, but it wasn't like all the time. It happened right. you know, a few times a year. Right. Um, and, you know, we would, I, we would drink at his behest, but it was, you know, I would, it was for me, I was good after like three beers. Sometimes I'd, I'd go further, but um, I guess, I guess uh, going into public, I didn't really start going into public and drinking because I couldn't when I was with him because I was still underage mostly. And so that didn't really happen until after um, I left him. And I bring that up because you go through a pretty bad marriage and you come on the other side of it as a 22 year old who's never really been able to go out and do things and live the life of a young person. I felt pretty controlled. And so I think that after after things ended with him and I had this kind of like new lease on life where I could go out and not be like, where are you? Take me with you. Come home. You know, mm -hmm. like that's when I think it, it was finally like I get to go out and I get to hang out with coworkers and everyone wants to buy me shots because they know that I I'm, I'm free now. <laughs> like <clears throat> I think that's when things started. So it might be a little. I don't know if I answered your question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, because you feel whatever the the complexities of being in in a relationship and being in a marriage and sort of the obligations and the constraints um yeah. and you know potential codependencies and all the stuff that comes with that especially being in something that you know and then pour alcohol on top of that mm -hmm. and then being having that sense of like i'm free now mm -hmm. and now i can be I can live how I want and yeah. this is what I want yeah. and this it's the 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 idea of unbridled freedom yeah um leads us to take all the shots and you know oh yeah I, I really, <laughs> that's really when it started I don't think it ever really stopped I think you know I was I started playing in a couple different bands I had always just been by myself but I was in bands and so going out with with people that I was meeting in the music scene because I was doing more and more music stuff going to more and more parties I was just you know, there was that freedom and I was I was becoming way more social than I've been and so um you know there are instances where I, I mean there was one night where I was driving home and I was staying with my parents at the time and they knew they had to know it's like one of those things where parents know but I was driving home we had been bar hopping me and some music musician friends have been bar hopping back and forth between these two spots and I it, it's like 2 33 in the morning and I'm like oh shit I gotta go home my parents are gonna you know even though I'm 22 it's like they're gonna know I, I have to go home or else they'll freak out and so everyone's like please don't drive home you're you're trashed and I did it anyway mm -hmm. you know and I pretty much blacked out on the way home I don't really remember anything and in the morning I I had set an alarm at least I had the foresight of doing that so I'm getting ready to go my mom's saying goodbye to me and I open the back door to where my car is and my tire is just like a piece of rubber and then like my uh what is it called the rim yeah mm -hmm. dented fucked up rim with like a piece of rubber and half of my bumper is just missing and my mom is just like what is and I'm and I have to think of something because I don't want to be like I drove home trashed and blacked out and probably should be dead or in a jail uh cell and so uh I think I might have been like oh I was tired and I was falling asleep at the wheel and I just kind of forgot about it until right now but I mean my mom is a smart person she was probably like are you okay like what's going on mm -hmm. and I think incidents like that I mean you know they didn't happen all the time that was an extreme one but my life was I think she found me passed out on the couch one night and there was like wine vomit in the toilet. And I just feel, you know, that was nine years ago now, but you feel bad putting your parents through that and making them worry, especially when she came from a, you know, a lived experience with her father. That was an absolute nightmare because the alcoholism and tendencies that he exhibited. And so um, I think that, I think there had to have been some point when I was 21, not 21, like 22, 23, when I recognized I, I drink heavily and I'm doing stupid shit, but you know, you're young and naive and part of you's like, well, you got to die somehow or whatever stupid things people say. Yeah. And so I think I recognized it in myself and I didn't really care. It was fun. I, I, I just kept doing it. So you said a couple things there about, um, 
your, you know, your mother seeing it in you and having to grow up with it from her father and being that sort of in the middle. And I, I, I feel that I, I, <laughs> I put my mother through very similar things in that way. And she dealt with her father in very similar ways. Um, yeah. And there's also this interesting thing you talk about and when we're in our early 20s or whenever, but um, especially with alcohol, this sort of dichotomy of suicidal self-destruction and invincibility and mm -hmm. that kind of get all balled up together. And we're just like, well, it doesn't really matter. None of this matters. We're just going to drink and have a good time. And, you know, mm -hmm. the whole live fast and leave yeah. it beautiful corpse or whatever the the phrase yeah. is um being quote or burn out instead of fading away or whatever right right yeah. right and um my god i but I, I i burned out so many times along the way you know yeah. what i mean and it it just yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't end and i would wake up and then i'd have to do it again and again and again um mm -hmm. and so was there a moment during all of this excess or what was the moment? I mean, so you're saying this is, um, you're nine months sober and you're saying that was happening nine years ago. Mm -hmm. um, how did, were there moments along the way where you were like, hey, I need help or maybe I oh, yeah. change? Yeah. For sure. I didn't, I don't think I started wanting to admit it or recognize it in myself until maybe like four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I went from I, I, my whole social life. When you're a musician, I'm sure you you know plenty of musicians and artists. I mean, um, you're you're in Eugene, right? Or, I'm in California, but uh, um, but I lived in Eugene for a very long time. Yes, yeah, I've been there several times. It's really cool. But I know mm -hmm. they've got quite the art scene and music scene, and so being Portland adjacent, I'm sure you're aware of all of that. But mm -hmm. um, you know, as a musician in in a in a very fairly tightly knit music community because El Paso isn't massive. I mean, it, it's everywhere. Like all my friends, all my social gatherings, everywhere. It's everywhere, and um, it's hard to recognize what it's doing to you when you're so inundated with it, when you're so surrounded by it. You know, I think for me, um, my mental health, uh, I have struggled with um, my entire life. I, I'm bipolar. Uh, I have ADHD. I say I am bipolar, but I actually hate saying that. And I wish I, I would remember that I'm not bipolar. I have bipolar. And I think my, maybe the distinction is important, but um, mm -hmm. it's something that I, I mean, for years, I, I just dealt with ma mainly the depression side of it. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't get diagnosed until like four years ago. Um, but I, I spent many years trying to get to a stable place because I felt so very unstable. And you know, when I, when I got diagnosed with bipolar in 2017, I, I took it upon myself to get, to figure out, I knew I had depression, but there was something in there that wasn't making sense. I had to figure out what it was. And so, you know, I got hospitalized a few times. I went to some psychiatrists. Eventually the dots got connected for me. I had a cousin who struggled with mental health issues. Um, his name was Caden. And uh, he, he died in 2016. Um, he was killed by, by cops in Mesa, Arizona, but he was suicidal at the time. And it, it was just, it was an experience that rocked my world. And I saw a lot of, I think me and him and that we both have struggled with our mental health in very different ways. Um, and uh, I think I didn't want to, I saw the pain that that whole situation left, not only on me, but on his family and just just exposed, being exposed to it was really intense. And I, it made me take my own mental health a lot more seriously. And I think it made me have to confront a lot of things. Um, and along the way, I, th th there's this same part in my brain that it's like, you struggle with depression, yet you drink every day, most of the time to the point of browning out, many times to the point of blacking out. Um, so it's kind of stupid that you're going to all these lengths to like try to quote unquote, uh, stabilize, but you're still, <laughs> you're still drinking every night in excess. And so um, it, I've just spent like the last four or five years 
being aware of that uh, contradiction and still like banging my head against the wall because I'm I'm an addict, I'm addicted to alcohol, and so um, it's it, it 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 felt like one of those things where it just didn't feel like it was I it didn't feel possible. I spent yeah. literally five years um, being very aware of drinking in excess and how much I wish I, I always, I'd always hear people talking about I'm sober or I've been sober or my musician friends and posting about it and people celebrating with them about it. And I used to make fun of them because I was a shithead and I was a bitter fucked up person. And the last several years I spent, you know, more often than not being marveling at them. And if not anything else, being jealous of them secretly. Um, and it just felt like something that was impossible for me to do because I spent four or five years being aware of it, hoping I could do something about it, but living in this pity party where I did nothing about it. And then, you know, somehow here I am doing it. So, <laughs> and, it, and it's it's um, musicians, especially that I've I've talked to, friends of mine, um, people who still drink, uh, people who are sober. Um, you you are surrounded by it. You're playing in nightclubs and bars all the time. People I know would get paid and you get, would get paid in drinks, in drink tickets, um, or there would always be a case of PBR in the green room or any number of things to get through the night or to <clears throat> get you to sleep when you're, I don't know, God forbid, sleeping in a van or something like that. And so it becomes touring too. And again, I've, I've never been on tour, but every, every story I've heard, it's exhausting. It's brutal. It's painful on your body. And then you have to stand up in front of you hope it's a lot of people and it may not oh. be oh. <laughs> and, and, and give all of this energy to a yeah. group of people. And no, it's no wonder drugs and alcohol. You're just like, I just need some relief from this and I don't so, know if I could have I think quarantine quarantining I don't know if I could be sober without it I mean I mean I ideally I could maybe I'm saying that not giving myself enough credit but I mean I tried getting sober in 2019 a couple of times mm -hmm. and here's 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 how you know this was hard for me or it felt like an impossibility for me Bad Religion is my favorite band. I'm obsessed with them. People know me because I do covers of them on YouTube occasionally. And in 2019, we were asked to open for them. Um, we were at, me and my, my guitarist, George, were, we went to Ohio to see them at a, play, at a, at a festival called Camp Anarchy. Uh, Jay Bentley, their bassist, after their set, comes up to us and says, hey, do you guys want to open up for us in the fall? And, you know, we were like, uh, of course, yes, please. We didn't even, you know, we didn't even bother asking the rest of our band. We're just like, mm -hmm. yes, when, where, tell us. And then he walked off. And one of the first things I said to, to George was, oh, I got to get sober. <laughs> and he's like, what, why? And I was like, this is a monumental opportunity to open up for one of the most legendary punk bands ever. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the face of the band. I do most of the planning and organizing for the band. I want to be at the very best I could possibly be. I, I've been wanting to be sober all year. And, you know, I'm saying all this drug, of course. Mm -hmm. But I, I recognized it in myself, like I have to get sober. I know that if I don't, I'm going to spend most every night of the tour blacking out and not remembering things that I will hate myself for forgetting later. And I did exactly that. <laughs> I did literally that. We still toured with them. We still had a great time. I think we still did a great job. Um, I managed to play on stage only buzzed, but I blacked out many nights and I just couldn't kick it. And that's a regret I have. Um, and so I say that in the absence of having a quarantine where I'm not at shows every night, where I have no, you know, where, where, where I'm still in that scene constantly. I don't know if it would have been as possible as it has been. So I think for me, it's been a, a kind of a blessing in disguise. So what was it? What was the moment in quarantine? Or so we're we're saying we're saying nine months ago. So this yeah. was this was in last summer, last fall. Summer? Yeah. Okay. Um, what was the moment that you finally said enough is enough? 
It's weird because I don't think it's it's so weird how stories are all different. I feel like mine's boring. <laughs> I wasn't like on the floor, like crying into an empty bottle of Kentucky Bow. Um, <laughs> it'd be funny though. Did drink a lot of Kentucky Bow. Um, I I mean, you know, I it was just I'd spent the first half of COVID, you know, getting drunk in my house every night, um, and you know, it just there's something about redundancy that drives me crazy. And, you know, before quarantine, at least you'd go out and maybe I was getting drunk at the same two or three bars, but I was out with people and there was distraction and maybe I was playing a show. So there was that, but, you know, when you're just in your house for six months, yeah, getting trashed every night, at some point you just, and I, I already was dealing with depression and self-loathing and suicidal ideation and all those lovely things that come with bipolar and alcoholism. And, um, I had taken it upon myself to start speaking to a therapist. Um, I had a very close friend of mine whose mother passed away a couple of years ago, and I wanted to, I wanted to be there for them, and I felt like I hadn't been. Um, the night she was in the hospital, I was trashed, and I, they were quite clearly concerned about her, and I, I was trashed. And it's another one of those guilt things that I carry with me that maybe. They've said I shouldn't, but I still do. And so it was like, I want to be there for this person. I want to support this person. And maybe if I go to therapy, maybe if I, maybe therapy will help me get sober. And maybe, maybe I could be a better support system for them while they grieve. If I, it was just, I don't know, it was a thought. So I, I start seeing this therapist and express to them that I, my awareness of my mental health issues, my awareness of my, um, abuse of alcohol and this sort of desire it was like this apathetic desire to quit like I don't want to quit because what am I going to do in the absence of this thing what the what am I going to do in the absence of it I don't know freak out I don't want to freak out and so it was kind of like I'm aware of this issue I'd like to fix this issue I've wanted to fix this issue but at the same time I don't because I'm Jekyll and Hyde so um she spent the next six months checking in on me once a week. And it was always the same redundant song and dance of I'm still drinking. Let me tell you about um, my childhood traumas and why I'm still drinking every week, the same thing, blah, blah, blah. And then it was just, it was this very average boring day where of course I woke up hungover. Um, it was never, it's always the morning after that was the hardest thing for me. And it wasn't because I was hungover it was a mental hangover more than anything else I could live with nausea and stomach aches that never whatever that wasn't it it was just a mental hangover the next day that I'd have where I would just have to every morning deal with suicidal ideation it gets really old especially when you don't want to kill yourself it's just there you know I do. um so I saw this weird video. I'm, I'm, I'm having these thoughts. I'm going through the guilt, the everyday morning guilt that I'm going through. And I saw some video like on Instagram or Facebook of a lady who was talking. It was like one of those self-help videos that are like all inspiring with the music that really don't normally don't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. She's talking about how she, when she was a young mother was, I don't remember her name. I wish I would. Otherwise I'd, I'd direct you in, in towards it, but She's talking about how as a young mother, she was incredibly poor, like to the point where she could not afford diapers for her kid. And uh, she had to, she had like $11 to her name and she was trying to figure out how she could like be a mother. And at one point she told her kid when she was wrapping him up in not a diaper, who knows what, she was telling him like, this is the poorest we'll ever be. I promise you, this is the poorest we're ever gonna be. I'm gonna figure this out. And she said she had this moment of recognition where she, she knew she had to put literally everything else to the wayside in her pursuit to no longer live in poverty. Um, she had to prioritize herself before everything else and that pursuit. And I don't think I ever, that really ever registered me in the past where if I wanted to get sober, I had to place sobriety before everything and everyone else. To me, it was just like, you know, you want to get sober, you just have to like do this or that, or, you know, you can go to a program or you can see a therapist or you, whatever approach you have, but you can also keep living your life. Your life doesn't have to change. Your drinking just has to be the thing that changes. 
uh, I never really, it never really clicked to me that you have to put sobriety, especially if you're like, if you're struggling with something in the way that I think people struggle with addiction, I don't think it registered with me that that had to be the thing that I put first. And I had to put everything else kind of build everything else around it, like a reorganization of my life that never really clicked with me until I heard that video and it made sense. And so that was kind of incubating in my brain. And then I had a conversation with my therapist later that day where I was talking about all sorts of things. And that kind of, she's like, you know, with regard to this friend that I, that whose mother passed away, she kind of indicated, you know, that includes this friend. I know you want to be there for this friend and support this friend. Um, but if you want to get sober and support them, you have to even put your sobriety in front of your friendship with them in order to do that. And that, that made me have like a full on panic attack. This is one of those important people to me in my life. Like I, I adore this person and the idea of like having to put them aside, having to put my music aside, having to put all these things aside just so I could get sober, like it freaked me the fuck out. And so you know, we had our call, our call ended and I'm just like on the couch, like shaking and crying. And I think it was just kind of like all these little building blocks and one weird day that kind of coalesced into a moment of like, oh, like I actually have to like do all these things or else I'm just going to spend another five years. It's like when my marriage ended, my biggest fear was like being in a shitty marriage for another 10 years that like yeah. in that kind of redundant shitty spiral and so I think there was that recognition of I'm going to spend another five years being like in this shitty cycle and I don't want to. And so I went into the bathroom and I'm crying in the mirror and I'm yelling at myself and I'm pouring my bottle of Kentucky bow down the sink and I'm like, you have to do that, damn it. And so that was it. It's I don't think there was any like big rock bottom. It was just more of an understanding of what needed to happen, I think, better than I'd ever had an understanding of before. And that, you know, you talk about, you have to put it, put the sobriety ahead of everything else. And when you're drinking, that sounds terrifying because alcohol has been, at least for me, it was the foundation of everything that I did. Yeah. And so pulling, pulling the rug out from underneath you and then having to sweep the floor and, and, and find a, another place to stand. Yeah. And <clears throat> I, I, in those early, in those early days of sobriety, you're like, my God, I'm never going to be able to, and I don't know if you had this, but I'll never be able to write again. I'll never be able to, um, you know, what was, what, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the change in finally saying I need to put sobriety first and then the feeling of what it would be like to approach writing and music and playing music? It's interesting you bring that up because I remember you and you um, you and Jerry had an episode that kind of resonated with me regarding that. And I, I mean, you have so many episodes that I'm probably going to, any reference I make to them, I'm going to mess up. But I remember you talking about having this cool kind of like, I don't know who you referenced, but it, it was like Hunter S. Thompson or Jack Kerouac kind of Ernest mm -hmm. Hemingway type, you know, feeling that you have to have when you approach writing, you know, um, where it, that it felt like in the absence of that kind of mindset, it would be a, much more difficult. But then you would also go back and read the stuff you wrote and you would just be like, I think it's like, you feel like you're so deep, you're all trashed and you're like, my life is so intense and here's these things, alcohol fueled ramblings. And then the next morning you'd read it and you'd be like, dude, this is shit. Like, <laughs> I remember hearing that episode of being like, dude, mm -hmm. what is <clears throat> notebooks full of cringeworthy nonsense <laughs> yeah. and whining oh my yeah. goodness it was Dude, just mm -hmm. I related to that so hard I have so many journals where it was me writing sober just like still drinking still hate myself it's 2015 guys mm -hmm. <laughs> so I mean I related to that and there is that fear honestly I haven't written a single song this year and so it is scary and I get really in my head about songwriting I wrote several songs around the time that I got sober last year. Mm -hmm. um, they're all going to be on this album. So that we're releasing here in a couple weeks. Um, and so that's exciting to know that it's still possible. Um, I never really was one for writing when I was drunk. Um, so I don't think that was, mm. I mean, I, 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 I have dabbled. I've come up with ideas, maybe riffs or things like that, musical things, but I've never been like, 
anytime like late at night when I'm trashed, I'm like, I'm going to text myself lyric ideas because I'm so good. And the next morning I read them and I'd be like, like, why would you text me? This is shit. Delete it. <laughs> Get rid of it. It's terrible. <laughs> and so I, I'm, there is this nervousness because I have had a little bit of a writer's block lately mm -hmm. or just haven't really invested enough time. But I think it's the same thing with sobriety. It's something that you have to invest in. It's, it's not just something that you are given. It's something you have to work for. It's what I'm learning. And that's the yeah. same with regard to creating art. Is It's not something you just like, I'm a, I'm a brilliant genius. I woke up this morning and I have five new songs ready. Here you go, world. It's something that you have to make time for, sit down, stress out over a little bit, invest in, and then you'll have something. And that's always mm -hmm. been the case with or without alcohol. So, right. Right. Yeah. Um, so did you, did you find that you needed, um, getting sober? Was there, was there a program you were drawn to or was there, um, how, what was your, what was your process? Um, there is a program I was drawn to. Um, I'm, I, uh, I don't follow it in the traditional way, maybe, and maybe I should. Um, I have a lot of, I have a very close friend of mine who um, goes to meetings and is very much involved in meetings and has done that for almost 40 years now. Um, There's someone who I consider like a mentor and a friend of mine. And um, for many years, I've even like attended meetings with him, even in the midst of just drinking very heavily because it's interesting to me. And so mm -hmm. um, I find the communal aspects of them very rewarding. I find a lot of the things in the literature to be very rewarding something two things that I, I found that I, I have related to aside from Jekyll and Hyde which was one of those but two other things um, is talking about the great obsession that resonated with me so hard the idea of the great obsession of every alcoholic is to drink like a normal person um, and I to this day have that if I could drink like a normal person I'd have a I'd have a beer in my hand immediately which means I couldn't <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> can I drink like an old person? Great, I'll have a beer. <laughs> oh, I'll have two. How many can I have? How many normal person beers can I have today? Right. So I mean, I relate. I relate to that a lot. And then um, the idea of contempt prior to investigation. I, I uh, that was me for a very long time. Um, and so, you know, I think I think I'm also a person that doesn't believe there's one path to anything. I think humans aren't monolithic. I think we all have different needs and different ways of all getting to the same place. And so for me, it's been a combination of um, podcasts such as yours, meetings, um, I, lifestyle adjustments. I, I used to not take care of myself really at all. My bedtime routine was I mean, there were nights I didn't even brush my teeth. I know that sounds fucking gross, dude, but like, it's just like my, my bedroom routine was like, take off my pants, put on pajama bottoms and plow into bed and just pass out mm -hmm. for, for a decade. And so it's been really rewarding to like use this money that I might've spent on whiskey or shitty beer and invest in it and like taking care of my skin or you know taking care of my hair or having a, a nighttime routine which I actually love now before I would be too lazy and be like I don't want to do anything but now it's like this little 10 minute interval in my night where I get to like prepare for slumber and sleep well and I don't know it's just I'm investing more time in, into beneficial things for myself that I never did before and so that's played a big role a big role is trying to fill the void of alcohol and finding good things to fill it with instead of just garbage other garbage you know right yeah yeah and 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 then i've also found too you talk we, we always are trying to fill this void and <clears throat> i have found along the way that in some ways there's no longer a void there to fill with anything it's just you know i i wake up and I do my thing in the morning and I, whether I go to work or I don't go to work or I go for a run and these things, I'm not, um, you know, the obsession, right? And so, and I think it's a little bit different in early recovery because, you know, you're still, I, at least I was for sure for 
um, still dealing with that and like, oh gosh, what am I going to do here? And how do I do this? And I better, how many more hours do I have to be awake? Because um, I, so how much, how much should I eat? And, you know, can I eat, you know, what, what, what kinds of things, just obsessions about everything. And, and yeah. so um, I would only say that the idea of the void has faded some. There's certainly still moments where I'm like, ah, I need something right now and I don't know what it is. And it's usually yeah. relief or sleep or exercise or water or something completely mundane that I am unwilling to um, just do. So I feel- Do you think, do you think alcoholics are maybe like restless by nature? <laughs> Yes, yes, I do. I think there is definitely uh, restless by nature. Is that's that's a beautiful way to put it. Yes, that's that's perfect. Um, so, so I think that's also why many recovering alcoholics, myself included, get obsessed with some sort of exercise routine. And so, because yeah. there's just energy, and I'm like, I, why do I have so much energy? I need to go burn it off. And then I to the point where I would literally run myself into pain and exhaustion wow. and come home, you know, take a shower and then pass out at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon because wow. I'm just going to burn it all off so that I don't have to deal with it. Right. Yeah. So yes, I think restless by nature is for sure. And um, building the building blocks, right? Sobriety is the, 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 the foundation. And then, okay, well, then I can put in my, you know, art or music or writing. I can put in friends and family and stuff like that. Oh, what is my relationship with food? Like that's my problem these days. Um, but so organizing that and trying to understand that and the ebb and flow and the, and the obsession and the, the glut and then the restriction and all that kind of stuff and, yeah. and figuring it all out. So but never once do I think, oh, well, I should probably just fucking drink and everything will figure it. You know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't occur anymore because I already know, right? You, we, I have investigated drinking as much as I possibly can. Like I have, I don't think there's anything new that I could learn Yeah. at a bar. I have yeah. done my time there. I have done my time drinking alone in my room. I have thrown empty bottles and full bottles under my bed, like all that kind of stuff. And so, um, and I, I, and I also, I just find it interesting, especially people who are, who are musicians and writers and artists and coming out of that sort of fog and then going, oh, I can still do this. And, you know, you said, I haven't written any songs this year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know like what your usual songwriting process is, but I think sometimes we need to, you go, okay, well, I got to go back and focus on that sobriety. And then those other things will come I believe that, eventually, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they were there before they haven't gone away. Your brain is just restructuring how it sees the world. Yeah. So um, I wanted to, so can you, on one of our first reactions on our uh, interactions on Instagram was about Emily Davis and the murder police and who okay. they are okay. and um, where the name came from. Okay. And I love this uh, story. <laughs> um, can you yeah. tell me where the name came from again or tell our folks, listeners? People think it means something it doesn't. And that's because they have contempt prior to investigation. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, I'm in a band of a bunch of shitheads, but I am also a shithead so mm -hmm. works out. we um we go on tour and we end up like we'll we'll watch like a video or see something really dumb and it makes us laugh you get the tour crazies and so we end up like repeating the same stuff to each other non-stop so a lot of key appeal a lot of tenacious d a lot of just comedy in general where there's like a little bit or snippet of something and we'll just quote it to death and any normal person would be like get me out of this shithead van but um, there was one tour four or five years ago where uh, we were on a very big John Mulaney kick and he's got a lot of really good bits but one of them that we really love is uh, his bit about law and order he's got a couple but the, mm -hmm. the one in particular is the one where he's talking about these tropes that exist within law and order 
um, stereotypical characters that end up being in every episode, no matter what. And so there's a guy who is continuously unloading crates <laughs> from yes. a van and he's like, dead guy, no, he's gotta unload that van. <laughs> or or um, the judge who allows everything. And so we, we'll, we'll still be like, I'll allow it, but watch yourself, McCoy. <laughs> and then, so there, the one that our band name comes from is he's talking in this bit about the New York bartender who recognizes every person that's ever been to his bar ever. And so the, 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 the homicide detectives show up and they're showing him a picture and the bartender's like, oh, a picture, not for nothing, but for a second there, I thought it was a tiny person. And then he's talking about this lady that the, the homicide detectives are looking for. Oh, blue shirt lady, blue lady. Why, did something happen to her? And they're like, yes, something most definitely did happen. That's why the murder police are here. <laughs> and so we, 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 were, we were in some hotel in the middle of nowhere quoting that for like the 80th time on tour. And I don't know, one of us, it might've been me, it might've been someone else. They're like, ah, Emily Davis and the murder police. And it was just like, oh, fuck. Like there wasn't even any kind of, coming up with a band name is so daunting and hard and not fun unless you have a moment like that mm -hmm. where everyone's just like, oh, fuck yeah, cool. That works, that's great. It just sounds cool. It lends itself to a lot of cool imagery and I don't know. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I was listening to the new album or at least um, portions of it that are available on Bandcamp right now. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk to me a little bit about where artificial happiness comes from, because that yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm projecting or I'm, I'm suspecting some things about it, but sure. um, I, I really enjoy that song. I was actually hoping that you would pick up on that song. So I'm <laughs> glad that you did. Um, so uh, this friend I was talking about earlier, who um, significantly older than me, but is somewhat of a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, he's a very good person and he often just is very kind to people and sometimes you know people will take advantage and a handful of years ago uh he was letting a homeless guy stay with him for a while who he found at a who he found at a casino um drunk and my friend loves going to the casino and playing roulette he does it responsibly but he ran into this other guy who happened to be a veteran also but was absolutely trashed and was homeless um, and they had, you know, a good conversation or something. And my friend pitied this man and said, Hey, I can help him out. I can let him come to my place, help him get him on his feet, maybe get him some like government assistance because he's because of his status. And, um, this guy stayed with my friend for maybe a month or two. And it was, it clear to me, at least from the get go that he was taking advantage of my friend and just he was plastered every day by 11 and it's easy to judge someone who, who does stuff like that, but it's like, I could have easily gotten to that place too. I don't know if I ever would have been willing to admit it, but um, I wasn't at the time. And so this guy was always just really like, I always felt him to be unbearable. He was just always very thinking he was saying all this deep shit when really he was just half intelligible with that. So one day I'm over and I'm, I'm hanging out with my friend and this guy, we'll call him Mike, that's not his name, but Mike was over and he was plastered and it's 11 a.m. And, and my friend and I are talking about all kinds of things and it somehow leads to alcoholism, which we'd often talk about because my friend had a history of it and he knew that I was, I was struggling with it. And we're having a conversation one-on-one -on -one and then Mike at one point just decides to grace us with his wisdom. And he kind of says something like slurs out, well, I'm bored every morning and I die every night. And, then, and that's the only thing he ever said of value around me because I was like, huh. And I, I related to it and it because mm -hmm. most nights, like I said, I would either brown or black out and that was done by design. Um, I There's anxiety that I have to deal with or, you know, just a restlessness by nature or whatever and so I found myself you know, seven or eight p.m every night itching to dumb myself down because my brain always is just like working like like a vortex of some sort I don't know how to explain it um and so uh I, I the idea of being bored every morning 
because life can get really redundant and boring. It feels like sometimes, especially at that time it did, but mm -hmm. dying every night to escape that redundancy. Um, I really, I related to it and, and I found it, I was kind of like, I'm going to take that. You, you won't remember ever saying that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> I borrowed that line and I, I used it, uh, in a song that was basically about, you know, escapism through yeah. drinking or whatever people use as a small death or a petite mort in their own lives. So it could be anything really, but for me, it's the alcohol has definitely been that. So I wrote a song about it. It's a great song. And I, I, I it's, I mean, and it, <clears throat> trade me one ugly truth for a hundred charming lies and you know the um we'll sh we'll settle for these shallow sips yeah but for now we'll bathe in this manufactured bliss and i'm like yes yes that's exactly yeah this whole thing and and to to also the torture of knowing better and still doing it is something that um was really really difficult and mm -hmm. I feel like it's far better now to struggle to be sober and struggle with wanting to have a drink than to be drunk and struggle with wanting to be sober. Yeah. This struggle feels a little bit easier yeah. than the other way around, you know? <laughs> you know, nine months ago, I, I, I would think the opposite. You know, it felt easier to just deal with that than the task of having to deal with everything without it that mm -hmm. that seemed so much more difficult in my brain and it has been hard but looking back it's just like man you're you're on the other side of things a bit and it's like that was way harder <laughs> like yeah, yeah. That was way shittier <laughs> way shittier yeah um what's um what's on the uh, docket for the rest of today like what's today look like for you compared to nine months ago I'm going to go see my family. They've been out of town. I've been dog sitting. So I'm going to bring their dog back to them and um, drink a lot of seltzers. <laughs> yes. An alcoholic variety. What do, you, what do you got there? Which one is that? Is that the. This is a aha lime watermelon. Nice. Nice. Yes. I always have like 10 beverages around me. I don't know if you relate to that either, but. I, I do. I just have still water and coffee for right now, but there's plenty of sparkling water in the fridge for sure. And I've been, I've been experimenting with like, you know, LaCroix the classic. Everybody's got that, but sometimes I'll pick up an eight pack of AHA at the CVS or um, something called Polar was on sale and it was all right. But um, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's partly habit, I guess, because I'm always used to wanting to crack something open. Yeah. Um, and I used to have this little habit where I would crack my beer and then I would turn the tab to the right so that I knew it was mine in the That's sea fine. of cans and stuff like that. I would take mine off, but people do that too. So it right. So I mean, I've kind of I've kind of given up that habit finally, but um, it's definitely still a habit of like I come home from work. I grab a cold one out of the fridge and it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's been, it's been an extraordinarily, it's just been a funny little ally in my, oh, yeah. you know, recovery is having a soda water, having a seltzer. I have so many of them. I buy so many of them. I, I can't believe how many of the, I used to like, when we were recording our first album, we were in the studio, our producer had a fridge full of LaCroix. And he wasn't sober. He just liked LaCroix. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying one and just being like, this sucks. This has, this is like potpourri water. It's like fizzy potpourri water. Who <laughs> drinks this? This is terrible. People, like, what kind of flavorless life do you have to have and lead to drink one of these? And I remember right. just being like, and now it's like a year, two years later, I'm, I inhale them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Emily Davis, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate your your time, your artistry, your music, um, and you know your sobriety. It's uh, it's it means the world to me that you did this, and to be able to know that you're coming from a better place than you've been before. Thank you. you. Know, 
it was so cool of you to have me. I mean, like, like I, I, I didn't really articulate this to people, but you guys had an instrumental role in my early sobriety. Um, I, I remember being on Spotify and just like, well, I got to do something. I mean, you know, meetings weren't really a thing aside from Zoom. And it's like, maybe I can just like find a podcast and I'm so picky and I have ADD. So I have to like something within a minute or else I'm, you can't convince me otherwise. And so I think I probably typed in alcohol or alcoholism and half the results were like people who were like, we're, we're alcoholics. Ha, ha, ha. And it's like, okay, that's not it. And then another, the other half were, we're alcoholics and that's not going to work either. And so uh, you guys just being really down to earth and real and not being afraid to say the word fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> that really like resonated with me. I was like, I, I think I'm going to listen to this podcast. And I've, it's, it's been a big help to me. So when you asked me to be on this, it was like, oh shit, full circle. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. You know, we try to, <laughs> we try to thread the needle between um, joyous, you know, sobriety and um, miserable sobriety. I mean, it's, it, yeah. we go through both every day, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, and I think that, um, again, being being an artist in sobriety is is a is not an easy thing and um i i just i appreciate what you do and thank, I you. thank you for doing this and you know nine months is is huge it huge. feels huge i'm huge. finally at a place where i could say that I, people would say oh you feel good after a month and i was like no i feel like shit <laughs> i don't feel <laughs> <Yes>. good <laughs> I finally had a place where I feel like I can be a little proud of myself and, and feel encouraged. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, again, thanks. And uh, I'll uh, be listening for the album coming out soon. So, yeah, it's out June 25th. It's never cool. moment alone. All right. <clears throat> thanks again for listening. Our music, as always, is by Neglect. You can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com. And you can find us on all social media platforms that matter. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us at aisforalcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs>